It should be on. Did you turn it on? Oh. How do you turn it on? Um, the button. There's been a um, group of us women who have been studying the armor of God. Um, Renee Van Heck started it. Um, it's really an awesome um, Bible study. And it's about um, how we need to protect ourselves as Christians and how um, that we are not up against um, flesh and blood, but we are up against um, the devil and his demons. So um, we have invited Dean Vandermeer, who has spent a good portion of his adult life studying um, about the spirit world. So he is coming here June 26, 6.30 p.m. Um, anyone is invited to come. Um, he's going to come at 6.30 p.m. to talk to us about spiritual warfare. So the only thing that I'd ask you to do is if you'd like to attend that, just kind of let me know. He wanted to know about a, a number so that he could provide handouts. So come for an evening of um, eye-opening, and it's going to be a great um, evening of talk what, and discussion. What day is that? June 26th. Yeah, what day? It's a Monday, Monday. At, at 6.30 p.m. here at church. All right. I don't know how to turn it off. Whoa. Ah, Father's Day. Hmm. I, uh, over the years, I've done counseling here and there and what have you, and probably most, most of the people, or a vast majority of them, all had father issues. Um, and a lot of the issues were um, my father's disappointed in me, uh, I can't meet my father's expectations. Um, and the question is, well, why is that? Why, why, why do so many feel like they don't meet their father's expectations? And one reason, of course, is that, well, it's a thing that's been handed down from father to son. Uh, my father often spoke of his father, and the phrase that his father often used, at least this is what my father said, is, I don't have time for that. And I didn't know my grandfather very well, because he didn't have uh, time. And so that whole thing gets passed on from generation to generation, but why is that? Why is this, this sense of not living up to someone's expectations. And I think part of it is, uh, at least traditionally, men have worked outside the house and, and the mom worked inside the house and did most of the parenting. And then after battling uh, the world out there in the workplace, they come home, they don't have time, they don't have patience, and uh, uh, they just, um, you know, they want things done right. So, a, a, lot is, a lot is at stake with this whole fatherhood because a lot of children will transfer that sense of not meeting their father's expectation to their heavenly father. And so, a lot of people feel like they don't meet their heavenly father's expectations and that God is somehow disappointed with you. And he's keeping track of all the things that you do wrong and you don't measure up. So there's a lot of, at stake. It's not just your children, but it's your children's view of God and trying to deal with him. So this morning we're going to look at six things. Oh, I have an outline back there. No? Yes? If, if uh, someone could pass those out. We're looking at six things. The, the six things that you looked at in this book if you uh, did your homework this past week. And uh, so we're going to look at, these are sort of like metaphors, I guess. Uh, and the first one is, uh, to be a great father, being a good coach. Proverbs 22, verse 6, start, a, start children off on the way they should go, and even when they're old, they will not turn from it. The old translation is train a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not turn from it. Training 
uh, is what a coach does. And I really like that metaphor of a coach. A lot of times as parents, um, specifically uh, fathers, the goal sort of is to have your kids um, obey, uh, sort of do the right things. Um, I was at the Tanger outlet last night, or about 3, 3.30, to look at the art of our, our people and so on. And there was a, a couple, and they had three little kids. And the whole time that I was sort of in their wake, uh, they were constantly correcting their, kid, uh, their kids. You know, don't touch that. Stay here. Uh, don't pick on your brother. I mean, it was one thing after another, after another, after another, and after another. And so as parents, our tendency is to, we just want them to be good. We just want them to obey, clean up their rooms, uh, uh, put their toys away, uh, you know, stick with us when we're at the mall. Uh, you know, if you would just, don't touch things you shouldn't touch. And so there's all this stuff. Um, but what I like about the word coach is a coach doesn't just uh, want good behavior. He's teaching specific things because there's a game on Friday night and we hope to win. I hope to develop you. I hope to give you skills that are necessary uh, in the battle of life. And so as parents, and specifically fathers, um, how, do we, how do we train our children uh, for life, not just, not just to obey, not just to be good, but there's a game uh, here. So coaches generally employ two different things. One, Proverbs 19, 18, discipline your children, for in there is hope. Do not be a willing party to their death. So on the one hand, there's discipline, and a coach will um, make you do laps. Uh, uh, the teams that I was on, if you did something wrong, you had to do something. You were, in a sense, punished in some way, but punished in a way that was designed to help you do better. So there's discipline. But there's also encouragement. Ephesians 6, verse 4, fathers do not exacerbate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. So we don't want to discipline our kids so much to the point where they uh, feel, again, like they can't do anything right. A good coach is also a good cheerleader. I, I, uh, when I, my first church up in Highland, there was a coach uh, in this little school, and he brought his little team to the state finals like two or three times, and then he moved to Minnesota. But he was an incredible coach, and I watched him during practice, and Every second of practice, he was saying stuff. And he was disciplining on the one hand, and on the other hand, he was building people up. Yes, that is the way to do it, and, and constantly. Because he, he wanted to build these kids to the point where they could accomplish something. And as dads, how do we build our kids up? Um, there's, uh, there's some great books out there. Um, uh, Coach Dundee has a book. He's a Christian guy. It, well, you know, if you, if, if you read some of these books, I think there's a book on Wooden, or what's his name? He coached Lou Cinder when he was Lou Cinder. Yeah, John Wooden, I think he has a book. It probably is worthwhile reading because the same skills that, that produce a good team are what you need as a father and as a parent. Okay, coach, next one, being a great player. This is a strange verse, but I, I love this verse. Without oxen, a stable stays clean. But you need a strong ox for a large harvest. So again, that tendency to want, you know, you want your home pleasant, you don't want any messes, uh, a lot of times the janitor at a school that's in charge of the gym, his, his mentality is, let's just not use the gym. It's clean. If people come in here, it'll be a mess, so let's not use it. And then the athletic director is like, we got to use this thing every single hour of the day because that's the purpose of the gym. 
So as a parent, sometimes, especially fathers, sort of check out. One out of five children are being raised uh, without a father in our country. Men often check out. And I, and I ask myself, so why is that? I think part of it is uh, the woman physically has the child, and she's sort of stuck with it. And the man has the option of just checking out. He was involved, but now he just checks out. Probably a lot of the abortions in this country are because of men, because they're not there. They check out. And it's not just men who are not there. It's men who are there, but not there. They're not really involved. And some of it is, I think, I think in, the, in our culture today, a lot of men feel inadequate. A lot of the shows, you know, The Simpsons, the, you know, the father, Homer, is, you know, he's a doofus. He, he, he can't do things, and he doesn't know how to make things happen in his home. And a lot of the shows sort of reflect that. And I think it is hard. Um, it used to be that the man taught his children things, especially the boys. Um, if he was a farmer, then he taught his children farming. He knew farming, and he taught his children what he knew. He's a hunter, and he taught his children hunting because he's teaching them what he knows. But now, people do so many different things. So my dad, when he taught me how to swim, he didn't know how to do it because his father never taught him how to swim. So he just threw me in the deep end and let's see what happens. If I float, I float. I'm sure he would have jumped in after me if I sank. But that was what he knew. So when I taught my children how to swim, I, may, I think I taught maybe the first couple, but I think the last two went to swimming lessons. And there's more involved than just throwing them in the deep end. They first make them blow bubbles underwater. Just, just blow bubbles. See if you can get, you know, there's this whole process. It's like 10 steps. You know, I didn't know any of those steps. And so, but, but that's true about almost everything that your kid well, is going to learn. There's some person that can do it way better than you. And so a lot of times as parents, we just step back. I don't know. I don't know how to teach my kid how to read. I don't know how to teach my kid how to play soccer. I don't know how to teach my kid God, the Bible, all these things. Someone else who knows how to do it better should do it because I'm inadequate in almost every area that, uh, that, I, that I could think of. And so we're getting well-trained kids who are, not a, who are not connected to their fathers. And then one day, when the kid is in trouble and the father wants to say something about life or about how life could go, a little advice, what relationship do you have? What have you ever taught him? So I think we have to make a mess. That's what this is. You, you know, uh, you can have a clean barn without an ox, but you'll never get a great harvest. But if you have an ox in the barn, he's going to make a mess. So... Make a mess. You want to teach your kids how to swim? Throw them in the deep end. See what happens. You know? Or make them blow bubbles first, because I told you that, and then throw them in. Make a mess. Some, <clears throat> you know, someone else can correct your inadequacy. Okay, oh, I forgot. I have that little thing on the end, don't I? Go back to the coach thing. As a coach, your job is to help your children succeed. It's not just correct behavior. You want them to succeed in life. And then the second one, as a player, your job is to spend time and energy with your kids. It's not going to be perfect, but so what? Being a seeker. If you want to be a great father, you need to be a seeker. Proverbs 15, 14, a wise person is hungry for knowledge, while the fool feeds on trash. And then I wrote, we all spend a lot of time searching the internet for information about whatever we're interested in. So we search the internet for stuff we want to buy, projects, um, things that we're interested in, sports, whatever it might be. Spend a lot of time searching and looking. Google is amazing. Uh, YouTube will tell you how to do everything. 
uh, under the sun. So we spend all this time searching for stuff. But uh, when's the last time you actually searched for how to be a good dad? Just try it. Put that in the Google search and see what comes up and uh, actually read it. Proverbs 18, verse 15. Intelligent people are always ready to learn. Their ears are open for knowledge. Uh, Proverbs 16, 26. It is good for workers to have an appetite. An empty stomach drives them on. To have that drive to learn about how to be a parent. Maybe talk to someone, you know, you see someone who's doing a really good job uh, with their children. Talk to them. Ask them, you know, what are the two or three things that you're doing that you think makes a difference uh, with your parenting? Or read some books. I uh, heard a book on, heard about a book, I uh, forget where I was, but I heard about this book entitled Playing the Man. Let me read just a little introduction. Polycarp, okay, this is going back. Um, 1,800 years, Polycarp, was dragged into the Roman Colosseum, discipled by the Apostle John himself, the aged bishop, faithfully and selflessly led a church at Smyrna, which is in Turkey, through the persecution prophesied by his spiritual father, do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer, writes John in Revelation 2.10, be faithful even to the point of death. John had died a half century before, but his voice still echoed in Polycarp's ears as the Colosseum crowd chanted, let loose the lion. That's when Polycarp heard a voice from heaven that was audible above the crowd, be strong, Polycarp, play the man. Days before, Roman bounty hunters had tracked him down. Instead of fleeing, Polycarp fed them a meal. Perhaps that's why they granted his last request, an hour of prayer. Two hours later, many of those who heard uh, the way Polycarp prayed actually repented of their sin on the spot. They did not, however, relent in their mission. Like Jesus entering Jerusalem, Polycarp was led into the city of Smyrna on a donkey. The Roman proconsul implored Polycarp to recant, swear by the genius of Caesar. Polycarp held his tongue, held his ground. The proconsul uh, prodded, swear, and I will release thee, revile the Christ. And then he said these words, Eighty and six years I have served him, said Polycarp, and he has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who saved me? Polycarp was led to the center of the Colosseum where three times the proconsul pronounced Polycarp as has confessed himself to be a Christian. The bloodthirsty crowd chanted for death by beast, but the proconsul opted for fire. As his executioners seized his wrists to nail him to the stake, Polycarp stopped them. He who gives me strength to endure the fire will enable to, me to do so without the help of your nails. The pyre was lit on fire. Polycarp prayed one last prayer. I bless you because you have thought me worthy of this day and this hour to be numbered among your martyrs in the cup of your Christ. Soon the flames engulfed him, but strangely did not consume him. Like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego before him, Polycarp was fireproof. Instead of the stench of burning flesh, the scent of frankincense wafted through the Colosseum. Using a spear, the executioner stabbed Polycarp through the flames, and Polycarp bled out, but not before not before the 12th martyr of Smyrna had lived out John's exhortation, be faithful even to the point of death. Polycarp died fearlessly and faithfully, and the way he died forever changed the way those eyewitnesses lived. He did what the voice from heaven had commanded. Polycarp played the man. So there's this whole book on how men can be real men. So read a book about being a man. Read a book about being a father. You look on your outline. As a seeker, your job is to learn to leave, sorry, leave no stone unturned in your seek, in your search for knowledge of being a better dad. 
being a leader with integrity. Proverbs 20, verse 7. The, God who, the godly walk with integrity. Blessed are their children who follow them. Then I wrote uh, in the book, Your kids know more about you than you do. They have watched you. you they have watched your every move. They see how you treat your wife. They see how you act with people outside the home. They know when you're telling the truth and when you're not. You are the most important example in your kid's life. Proverbs 24 or 25, 14. A person who promises a gift but doesn't give it is like clouds and wind that bring no rain. Then I wrote in the book, the number one frustration that kids report about their parents is broken promises. Yeah, if you do this, we'll go to the park on Saturday, and then Saturday comes, and something else comes up. Broken promises. Yeah, we're going to do this, but then in the end, you don't. Proverbs 22, verse 1. Choose a good reputation over great riches. Being held in high esteem is better than silver or gold. So being a man of integrity, but being a leader of integrity. Actually leading your children, not just trying to contain and make sure everyone does things right, but actually lead them. Lead them. Leading them is going in a certain direction. Let's go this way. It's trying to get people to follow you down some trail, not just sit there and be good. Okay, again, it's like being a coach. On my uh, trip to Scotland, uh, we went to Edinburgh. And in Edinburgh, on the highest hill, there's a castle. It's right, I mean, it's the highest hill overlooking everything. And just, just before you go into the castle, there's like a, a drawbridge or a bridge that goes through an arch. And on one side of the arch is a statue, and on the other side of the arch is a statue. And on one side is, on this side, yeah, this side is the Bruce. And on the other side is William Wallace. How many of you watched Braveheart? Yeah? Okay, Braveheart is the story of William Wallace uh, many, many, many years ago, and he led a rebellion of Scotland uh, against England. England was uh, taking advantage of Scotland. You know, even today, Scotland wants to leave, and there's all this trouble and so on. Um, while I was in Scotland a few years ago, I got a, a Scottish... Scottish English pound. It's all one country. And the pound is a pound. It's all the same money. But when I went back to London and I wanted to pay something with that Scottish pound, the guy looked at it like he'd never seen one in his life. It's like, you know, they just live right, right over here. This is the same money as your money. And he, he was reluctant to take it because it was Scottish. Okay, so there's this animosity. And William Wallace was, was, was fighting against it. And all the, 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 the lords in Scotland sort of compromised to get favors from England. So they were always betraying their own people. So the Bruce was one of those leaders. And, and William Wallace, there's one scene in the movie where William Wallace is talking with the Bruce, who later in the movie betrayed him. And he was killed and so on. William Wallace was killed because of him. But in the middle of the movie, he's trying to convince the Bruce to actually lead. And it's my favorite part in the whole movie. They're walking, and he's talking to the Bruce, and he says to him, if you would just lead, the people would follow. If you would just lead them, they're looking for a leader. They're looking for someone to follow. If you just step up and lead. And that's my encouragement to you fathers. Step up and lead. Again, you know, the barn isn't going to be, it's going to be messy. Uh, you don't know everything. So what? Lead and your children will follow. Okay. Being a leader with integrity uh, at the bottom there, as a leader, it's your job to lead. Okay, next one. Being a faithful husband. Being a faithful husband. Uh, 
Uh, where am I? Proverbs 5, verse 18, or let's go to Proverbs 5, 15 first. Drink from your own well, my son. Be faithful and true to your wife. And then in the book, I don't have it on your outline, but Proverbs 5, verse 18, let your wife be a fountain of blessing for you. Rejoice in the wife of your youth. Uh, so he's talking to someone at the very end of life. Uh, rejoice in the wife of your youth. You're still married to her. And then the, the verse I put with the uh, leader of integrity I want to use for this one, Proverbs 4.23, guard your heart above all else for it determines the course of your life. The biggest influence, fathers, that you will have on your children is how you treat your wife. Your kids will not only, especially your boys, if you have boys, uh, they will not only learn how to treat the opposite sex, but they will also learn how to treat their wife one day. And they're watching every move that you make. They see what really goes on. They see the public persona that you put on, but they also see what goes on at home. They see the arguments. They see the pain. They see the conflict. They see it all. So how do you deal with that? Husbands and wives are definitely not perfect, and there's issues between them. Um, so what do you do in front of your kids, and what do you do behind closed doors? You know what? They know what goes on behind closed doors, too. So you might as well just be honest with them. Tell them where you're at. Um, you're not perfect as a, a husband uh, or a wife, uh, so let them, let them know that you're trying to do your best, but... Work at it. That, what I like about Proverbs 4.23, it says, guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Uh, in movies, you, uh, the husband or the wife cheats on one or the other, and then when they're asked about it, they always said, well, my heart fell in love with something. The heart does what it wants to do. I'm not in charge of that. What could I do? It's not my fault. It's my heart's fault. This verse says, guard your heart. In other words, you can do something about what your heart falls for or doesn't fall for. Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the cause of your life. Look at the bottom again. As a faithful husband, it is your job to set an example of how a man treats his wife. And then finally, being a man of God. Proverbs 3, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. Then I ask the question, what issue or aspect of your life do you need to put into God's hands? Life is not easy. As a father, you have many different hats, many different roles. And some of these roles are difficult. Some of these roles, uh, it's not going well. Some of it's your own fault. Some of it's not. What aspects do you need to put into God's hands? Sometimes that's all you can do. Proverbs 14, 26, those who fear the Lord are secure. He will be a refuge for their children. Proverbs 16, verse 3, commit your actions to the Lord and your plans will succeed. So what plans do you have right now that you need to commit to the Lord? Proverbs 14, 14, backsliders will get what they deserve. Good people receive their reward. So we've been in this parenting series for the last seven, eight weeks. You've heard this, you've heard that. Um, maybe you've tried some of these things. Uh, next week we move on. Tomorrow is the beginning of a different series. Spending time is the title. When you walk out, you can get the next book for the next seven weeks. And what I did is I, I, I prayed about what we might look at, and God led me to think about how we spend our time. I mean, I, I, could, I could look at the Bible, and I could find all kinds of things that are very good and useful, but I thought, how do we actually spend our time? What do we actually do with our time and what does the Bible have to say about those things? 
the things that we actually do. So we begin that series tomorrow. The, there's, in the book, there's something for you to read and do uh, every day, uh, so Monday through Saturday, and then on Sunday we talk about what you've been reading. So that's how it works. So parenting series, done. Moving on to the next thing. And so it's very easy to just get back to the same old habits, maybe in trying some things. And, and a lot of times, again, I love that passage, you know, the ox in the barn makes a mess. But if you want a great harvest, there's going to be some mess. So are you going to keep doing these things or are you just going to forget it and go back to the same old patterns? Being a man of God. Um, in that book, you know, and I just... In the book um, that I told you about, what's the name of it again? Be the man. Play the man. Play the man. That's what Polycarp said, and so that's how he named his book. He, <clears throat> I just read the introduction because in my books you get free, you know, you sample, and that's what I do. I read a bunch of samples of books. So I know a lot of beginnings of things. I don't know how they end. You can guess how things end, right? You watch like 15 minutes of the movie and then you can just turn it off and watch the next one. You know how it ends. All right. He, he wrote... Uh, let me see. All right. Okay. I'll get to it. Trust me. Oh, oh, ye of little faith. I know, I know. It's not a tangent, it's all planned. All right. The 20th President of the United States, James B. Garfield, served 200 days in office before being gunned down. Garfield is the only president who was also an ordained minister. And Garfield is the only president who didn't run for the office. In 1880, Republic, the Republican National Convention was in a deadlock after the 35th ballot. Garfield wasn't even on the ballot at the beginning of the convention, but he somehow managed to win the nomination on the 36th ballot. How did a man who didn't even seek the presidency end up in the White House? I'm not a political scientist, but I have a theory. I think it traces back to a defining decision James Garfield made as a young man. And here's his quote. I mean to make myself a godly man. That's what he decided as a young man. And if I succeed in that, I shall succeed in everything else. Garfield made himself a godly man, then America made him president. So anyway, that's from this book. It's probably a really good book. I just know the beginning part. Being a godly man. That really is the key. It doesn't mean you're a perfect man. It means you're trying to follow Christ. Uh, to get to the bottom thing so that Denise is not nervous, that I might forget. As a man of God, your job is to lead your family in the Jesus way. That's, that's our theme here at Pathway, the Jesus way. The early Christians were actually called the people of the way. It was a way of life. It was a relationship with God, but it was also a way of life. And your family is there, and there's all these options coming. Our culture is saying, come this way. Our culture is saying, come that way. Every advertisement is saying, if you do this, it will be great for you. There's, there's pull and pushes everywhere. Uh, money, sports, uh, business, work, relationships, Facebook, Pinterest, eBay, it's, I mean, we are just bombarded. There's never a quiet moment in our lives. And your kids are being bombarded with so many things. 
you, don't, you have no idea what they're even being bombarded with. And they can go on the internet and find their own thing to be bombarded with. So there's pulling and pushing from every single direction. And here you are as a father. How are you going to pull? How are you going to push? How are you going to lead your children in the godly path? This is so... I, you know, I see so many people struggle with it. In some ways, for me, it was, it was probably a lot easier. My wife works for the church. I work for the church. Guess what? Our life has been the church. Our kids, you know, grew up in the church. This is what we do. This is our life. It's number one absolute priority. Well, it's pretty easy when you're getting paid to do it. A lot harder when you're not. You got other things, you got other responsibilities. But, you know, just, I, you know, I, I've, I've watched, you know, I've been at this long enough to, to watch when kids that were in my church were five and now they're 30 or 35. I don't know. I'm getting old. And, and I just, I see. You know, I think of one example. This is my, my early church, my first church. I was in the church, and a father was just weeping because his, his son was not going to church, didn't care about the th- everything that he taught. His son walked away. Uh, and then he told me, you know, back in the day, you know, when he was a kid, we used to play catch out in the yard every single day. He told me that story. He still played baseball. He still played softball. He gave up church, but he's still playing softball. In other words, how are you leading them? If softball is number one in your life, then your kid grows up and softball becomes number one in their life. If if church is number one in your life, God is number one in your life, you have a lot better chance of kids following. I know it doesn't go perfect. Again, it gets messy. Make God number one in your life. And I don't know what that means for you. Make him number one in your business. Make him number one in your family. Make him number one in your uh, recreation. Make him number one in all that you do. And let your kids see it. Don't leave it up to me. Don't leave it up to Pastor Jim. You Dad are the greatest, you know, with, with mom. You're the greatest influence on your kids, and whatever they do. And you doing, um, if you do the religious part, uh, let's say a quarter as good as I could have done it, it'll be better than if I did it. Coming from you, Makes all the difference. And enlist help. For, if, you have a, if you have your dad still there, enlist grandpa to help. If grandpa says something, the kid will never forget it. So lean on grandpa a little bit. And maybe he's not a real talker. So what? Get him to write it down. Grandpa, you need to write something down. I want you to bless my kids. I want you to say something important. I want to know what your favorite verse is and why it's your favorite verse. And Because my, my kids got to know that. They got to hear it. I was talking to one member of our church who his father is dying. Um, and I, I don't want to mention his name because I didn't ask if I could say this. But, and uh, the one thing I said to him is videotape him. Take the phone out and just videotape him and ask him all the questions that you want your grandkids to hear the answer to. So get help. Ultimately, being a man of God is relying on Christ because you can't do it on your own. That's what it is. See, here's the options. You can rely on Christ and honor Him and say, you know what, I'm just a servant. I'm just trying to do and be what He wants me to do, but I am the follower. I am not the leader. Okay, that's one option. The other option is if you're not following Christ, then you've got to make yourself the man and you've got to pump yourself out. And a lot of times... 
men will do that. They're trying to prove themselves to the eternal whatever. And then they, 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 they steal the thunder of their own children because their own self-esteem is so lack that when the kid does really well, they're like in a competition. So instead of praising the kid and encouraging him, it's like they're competing with them. But that's the only option. So follow, follow Christ. All right, we're going to pray, and then we're going to have the Guatemala send-off, um, which really, you know, I've been saying the whole time that this whole parenting thing is really leadership. It's about leading people, and that's what the Guatemala team is going to do. So let's pray a minute, and then we'll do that. Lord, I especially pray for fathers. It's a tough job. It's an honor that you allow us to be a part of your creation, creating life. And sometimes as fathers, we feel distant from it. Uh, we feel inadequate when the child is small. We, we can't feed them. We can't comfort them as well as the mom. At least that's sometimes how we feel. And then the culture lets us know we're inadequate in almost everything that we do as a parent. Lord, inspire us to, to disciple our children, to lead our children. We are called. If you're a father, you are called to lead. It doesn't matter what your gift set is. If you think you have the, you know, the gift of leader, it doesn't matter. You are called to lead and lead the best that you can. Children don't always follow. Train a child in the way he should go takes two. Sometimes children resist the training. Our job is to do as best we can. And then ultimately, we put our children into your hands. And I know some here, that's what they need to do. You just to step back and and uh, put that child in your hands. And you have a plan. Sometimes it's a long, twisting, turning plan, but you have a plan and help us to trust you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So we're going to... Oh. What are we doing? It's all right. Oh. We're just ready. What's that? You were ready. He's ready. <laughs> Oh, we're going to sing and then do the thing? Yeah, we're going to sing while they come up. Oh, okay. Good to know. All right, we're going to sing while the Guatemala team comes up. Let's do it.
Matthew's gospel, Jesus tells us to go and make disciples. In the gospel of Mark, Jesus calls us to go and tell the good news to everyone everywhere. In the gospel of Luke, Jesus promises to send the Holy Spirit to be with us. And in the gospel of John, Jesus says, as the Father sent me, I am sending you. What is a mission? It's sending forth people somewhere to serve. God sends people on a mission. What is a commission? It's granting authority, allowing us to act on behalf of another. God commissions people to go for him. Do you, okay, now I'm talking to the mission people, do you recognize your mission of being sent forth by God to a specific service? Then do you accept your assignment as a commission from God to go and act on His behalf? And do you accept the responsibility of representing this congregation in doing the work of our Lord in Guatemala? Will you work to demonstrate Christ's teachings by loving one another and by translating Christ's message with excitement and care, turning strangers into friends? and friends into brothers and sisters. Do you commit yourselves to serving faithfully on this trip in ways that bring honor and glory to God? Will you serve with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love, treasuring your experiences as opportunities to learn and to grow? All right, now this is to the congregation. Do you accept these people as missionaries chosen to extend our Christian love and concern to others? We do. Will you continue to support them with your prayers during their venture and with your interest upon their return, recognizing their special contribution to the work of God's kingdom and their mission as your own? All right, now we're going to have to have you guys come down here because there's no way they can lay your hands out up there. So come on right here. And then all of you, get out of your seat here and just gather around them as best you can. Like, I don't know how you can just squeeze in. <coughs> Some of you will have to be in a row here, but be touching distance from somebody. There you go. All right, so just put the, your hand on the shoulder of the person in front of you. Okay, are we all connected? Yeah, sometimes you just have to do the life force thing, a little distance. All right, so we're going to pray. Lord God, you call us to go into the world, and we don't get too far usually, but... We're sending these folks to another country, another culture. And I pray that you will enable them to be genuine, to love, uh, not in a condescending way, but in a way that recognizes that you're at work already, and we're there to extend your love to people who... Um, have their own ways of doing things, some, some of which is better than ours. And so uh, I pray that they will just be open to being used by you in any way. Sometimes it's just a smile. Sometimes it's just a small gesture of, of community and being a part. There'll be building of houses and, and making stoves and trying to improve people's lifestyle, but in the process, we demonstrate your love, and we pray a blessing as they go. Father, we, we also pray for leadership. We've just uh, listened to and read about this week and thought about fathers, and uh, we've been challenged this morning to lead, and Lord, I pray for uh, our team that they will lead one another, that they will have opportunity to lead people to Jesus. 
pray that uh, as uh, particularly the youth, as they return, that they will have not only been led, but have a sense of responsibility for leading themselves, leading in their place of work or their, their school situation or among their friends. Uh, you call us each to be an example of Christ to the world around us, to lead people to Jesus and to lead people to the Father. So I pray for their leading. I pray also a hedge of protection around them uh, with their travels uh, as, they, uh, as they go to Chicago, as they fly to Guatemala, as they move around from place to place. Watch over them and keep them safe, we pray. Pray also against illness, uh, going to a different culture, different food, different water. Uh, we pray that you protect them, their health, that they can remain strong to serve you well. Father, go with them. Uh, be glorified through them. We ask this in Jesus' name. Let God's people say, Amen. Amen. Yay, guys. Okay. Wait for the Lord. Hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with the Lord is great power to save. So people of God, receive his blessing. Go into the world with assurance, hope, and promise. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ rests upon you. The love of God, creator and giver of life, embrace you. And the transforming power of the Holy Spirit uphold you this day. And for all your days. Amen. Amen. All right. Will you join us for a little fellowship through the double doors? And make sure you pick up the next series on the table out there. And if you need prayer, please come to the front. And if you want to give up oh, our offering. We didn't do the offering. Bring it up front. Someone just put the basket over by the door. I don't know. One, two, three, four. I didn't know you did it. Oh.